following lecture was produced by Glorianne Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. Compassion and Veneration and Elohim, blessed Noah and his sons, and said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth, and your compassion and your veneration shall be upon every beast of the earth, and upon every fall of the air upon all that creeps on the ground, and upon all the fishes of the sea, into your hand are they delivered. Genesis 9, verse 1 and 2. Compassion and veneration follows the fruit, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. In the sequence of precepts of alchemy, that we are studying and which are written in the Zohar. It is necessary to listen to the previous lectures regarding the precept, the multiplication of the human species, in order for us to understand this ninth precept, according to the alchemical level in which we are here and now. The ninth precept is illustrated by Daniel the prophet in the den of lions. Daniel is praying while the lions look at him with reverence. Daniel is performing the ninth precept that we call compassion and veneration. Let us study the Hebrew words written at the beginning of Genesis 9 verse 2. Vav, the first letter in both words, means and. The first word is morakom, which is usually translated as fear. The second word is hatkom, which is also related with fear. Morakom hath come, is commonly translated as, and your fear and your dread. Fear and dread means the same thing. Thus, it does not make any sense. But when we study alchemy and Kabbalah, we discover that the word mura means mere in Aramaic. Mura is an Aramaic word that relates to the aromatic gum, usually related with death. Not that death which we usually think of uh, the termination of life for the physical body, but the, the psychological death that we had to suffer together with the Lord, which is the passion of the Lord. This is in order to develop compassion, which is a word that means to suffer, 
the passion, patty, together, come. The English word passion is also associated with sexual intercourse. Thus, come, passion, also means come, the longing of desire to become together in the sexual act, which is a consummation of love. It is very interesting to see the word compassion related with the Aramaic word mura or the word mir in Hebrew. <coughs> mir, mura, is that gum that is burnt associated with rituals in order to attract the higher forces of higher sephiroth. When we study the book of the Master Samael on Veor, in the book Igneous Rose, the master explains that Mir or Mura relates to the different levels or Sephiroth of the Tree of Life. These levels are named in Sanskrit Atala, Vitala, Sutala, Rasatala, Talatala, Mahatala, and Patala. Seven regions of the tree of life that relate to all of those monad or forces that come from the solar absolute down into the earth, passing through the different levels or the seven heavens in order to reach the physical world, the three-dimensional world, which is Malkuth, the very bottom of the tree of life. The force that descends from the Ain Sof down to Malkut, named the Ray of Creation, is a force related with compassion. This all is reverence in different levels. Indeed, all is a power that can show compassion to the different souls or living beings on any planet. It is a force of love related to the spirit, the Ruach Elohim. Compassion and veneration is awe and reverence to yod He vav He that is expressed when the alchemist feels, embraces, unleashes, and shares, come together, the passion of the Lord which is a superior emotion that pulls our consciousness towards a perfect relationship with the solar Christ, the limitless light, or the ends of all. In the Zohar, they always talk about the inner man that we have to develop. In order to develop Christ, we have to be compassionate. We have to give. There is another force that has to be associated with that giving, with that compassion for the souls. That is a force of veneration. It is usually translated in the Bible as fear or dread, but really it is to be in awe. It is that veneration that we have to feel towards divinity. Elohim is compassionate. He sends his dharma, or light force, down to every soul. We need to venerate Elohim in order to receive his light, which is precisely the main point of this lecture. In order to be compassionate, or to exercise compassion in our life, we have to venerate. We have to bring down the ray of Elohim. If we want to help the poor with money, first we have to make money. When we make the money, then we give it because we have it and because we work for it. Likewise, for Dharma to be expressed, we have to exercise veneration. That is, to venerate and to worship Elohim who is the one who bestows our heart 
with his light abundance. This is very important to understand. Light is associated with compassion and veneration, represented in the graphic where we see Daniel in the den of lions. Let us read what is written in the book of Daniel, chapter 6, in order for us to understand how Daniel exercised compassion and veneration in order to be assisted against the lions. Men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. Then they came near and spake before the king concerning the king's decree. Hast thou not signed a decree that every man that shall ask a petition of any god or man within thirty days, save of thee, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, The thing is true, according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which altered not. Then answered they and said before the king, That Daniel, which is of the children of the captivity of Judah, regardeth not thee, O king, nor the decree that thou hast signed, but maketh his petition three times a day. Then the king, when he heard these words, was sore displeased with himself and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men assembled unto the king and said unto the king, Know, O king, that the law of the Medes and Persians is that no decree nor statute which the king establisheth may be changed, nor a statute which the king establishes may be changed. Then the king commanded, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. Now the king spoke and said unto Daniel, Thy God whom thou servest continually, he will deliver thee. And a stone was brought and laid upon the mouth of the den. And the king sealed it with his own sign and with the sign of his Lord, that the purpose might not be changed concerning Daniel. Then the king went to his palace and passed the night fasting. Neither were instruments of music brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste unto the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried with a lamentable voice unto Daniel. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest continually, able to deliver thee from the lions? Then said Daniel unto the king, O king, live forever. My God hath sent his angels and hath shut the lion's mouth, that they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Then was the king exceedingly glad for him, and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no matter of hurt was found upon him, because he believed in his God. And the king commanded, and they brought those men which had accused Daniel, and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children, and their wives. And the lions had mastery of them, and break all their bones in pieces, 
or ever they came at the bottom of the den. The King Darius wrought unto all people, nations, and languages that dwell in all the earth. Peace be multiplied unto you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom men tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever in his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. And his dominion shall be even unto the end. He delivereth and rescueth, and he worketh signs and wonders in heaven and in earth. Who hath delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? <coughs> Many fanatic people believe that they have enough love for their God, that if they were to be thrown in a den of lions, they will be saved. Daniel's ordeal is not a matter of believing, but a matter of alchemy. It is an ordeal related to certain alchemical level that the initiate reaches, where he reaches a development in his heart. Compassion and that love to God which enables him not to accuse anyone. The lion represents passional fire and the laws of the law of karma. Every time you see a lion in your dreams, it means that your karma is approaching you according to your passion. People in many initiates, initiates are always against the laws of karma because they apply the law in accordance with the deeds of each one of us. First, as you see in the graphic, Daniel is venerating his own God. This is done by performing the passion of the Lord through the alchemical work that we have to do and in order for his God to exercise compassion to humanity. These two forces, compassion and veneration, are related to Bina, the Holy Spirit, that receives the name of Jehovah Elohim, and that is translated in the Bible as Jehovah God. Revelation chapter 2, verse 23 states, I am he who searches the fire of the kidneys and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your deeds. Nefesh Chaya is the soul of Bina. It is the sexual force in all of nature. It is Hai, life, related with Mem, the fluids of Yasod, where we find the Yod, or Shakti potential of Elohim, which in Kabbalah and, and alchemy is named Nahera the river of Eden. <coughs> and Elohim Binah said, Let Hamayim, the waters of Jesod, bring forth abundantly Nefesh Haya, living souls. Genesis 1, verse 20. In the Bible, Nefesh Haya, the soul of Binah, is addressed in different manners in order to show its different manifestations, namely, Hai, life, 
Haya, creature. Haim, the living. Hayot, beasts. In all of these words, we always find the word Hay. That is related with the letter Het, whose shape is formed by the union of two letters. Or better said, the union of two yards or Shakti potential, which form the heads of the letters Vav and Zayin. Thus, in accordance with the alchemical translation we have made in relation to Mura or Mir of Genesis chapter 9, verse 2, we state that through the alchemical priesthood of Vina, we revere. We invoke the light of Elohim and thus exercise compassion from above and express it through ourselves. But we have to grasp Bina and venerate Bina through alchemy. This is in order for Bina to be active, since Bina is a conjunction of two wills or fires. This is why in Genesis chapter 9 verse 2 states, And your compassion and your veneration shall be upon every hayot. This is how it is written in the Bible. Beasts of the earth, upon every fowl of the air, upon all, the, all that trips on the ground, and upon all the fish of the sea into your yard, and are they delivered? Genesis chapter 9 verse 2 is written after the event of Noah, after Elohim saved him from the flood. When Noah leaves the ark, Elohim tells him that all the beasts, that is, all the chayot, that he kept in the ark are delivered into his yard, hand, or in the hands, yards. This is an alchemical statement. Do not fall into the mistake of thinking literally that the ark was a three-dimensional ship made of wood built by Noah. We know very well that through alchemy, Noah made an ark of wood, but that wood contains the Yad, or Shakti potential from the tree of good and evil, which is the sexual energy. Because we need to know how to control the Yad, or wood fires of Eden, for out of the Yad of Adama, May Jehovah Elohim to grow every tree that is pleasant to the spiritual sight and good for food. The tree of life also, in the midst of the garden, and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Genesis verse 2, verse 9, or chapter 2, verse 9. Wood contains yod, an element that we need to be concerned with, which is profoundly alchemical. That is why we find the name of Bina, Jahava Elohim, or yod he Elohim, in Da'at. In order for us to understand that the whole alchemical work that we are explaining here relates to the name of Elohim in Bina, that we already said is Yod He Vav He. Yod Hava or Jahava is the same Elohim in Bina. This is also the name of Elohim in Da'at. Yod Hava and Elohim are one unity that we explained already in previous lectures. <coughs> Therefore, we develop the different levels of compassion 
in accordance with our veneration, that is, in accordance with our alchemical work. This alchemical work is always related to Haya. In Kabbalah, we state that Haya, Bina, is that soul that relates to the different levels of Ot Haim, the tree of life. Venerating Haya, the soul of Bina, is how we eventually receive the Neshama Haim, soul of life, and become, when we resurrect from the dead, one with the soul of Bina, Nefesh Haya, which the Bible translates as becoming a living soul. So when someone's soul, Tiferes, reaches the level of Bina or Nefesh Haya, such a soul controls the other levels of Haya because Hai life is within the birds of the air, the fish of the ocean, all that creeps on the ground, and also within Hayot, the beast of the earth. All of this is in relation with Malkut and the third triangle of Otz Haim, the tree of life, because the beast of the earth represents Hod, the fall of the air, Netzach, all that creeps on the ground, Malkut, and all fish of the sea, Yesad. We are going to study all of this little by little in order to understand how we have to work with that in order to gain what we are talking about here. Let us now study the graphic where we find the beautiful picture of the god Zeus with the goddess Io. Zeus or Jupiter is Yod Pater and Io is Ram Io or the Yad of the sea which in Spanish and Latin is mar or mare. Here we are talking about ma, the female, the female aspect of Bina, who is Io. Ram Io is the one who venerates Io Peter. They are the two fiery yards of Haim. Thus, if there is not veneration and compassion, how is there going to be union of heaven and earth? In the book of, the first book of Samuel, verse, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 1 to 10, we read, My heart rejoiceth, in Yod Chava. Mine horn is exalted in Yod Chava. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in your Jesus. There is none holy as Yod Chava, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our Elohim. Talk no more so exceedingly proudly. Let not arrogance come out of your mouth. For Jalhaba is an Elohim of Gnosis, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of mighty men are broken, and they that stumble are girded with the strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren has borne seven, and she that has many children is waxed, 
people. Yochaba kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up, makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are Jodhabaz, and he has set the word upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints, and the wicked shall be silent in darkness. For by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of Jodhaba shall be broken to pieces. As Jupiter out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. Jodhaba shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his kin, and exalt the horn of his anointed. <coughs> <coughs> the woman represents veneration, not because we men cannot venerate, but because Malkut, the lower Sephira, is feminine. When we are praying in veneration to our God, with the hope of receiving his compassion, his force, our nature then turns into its female aspect. <coughs> a female archetype. <sighs> Thus, this is how the earth Malkut, Io, receives the force of the god, Iopiter, or Jupiter. And that is why in sexual alchemy it is stated that the man opens the vagina with his phallus. The male force represents Jupiter, who is the one that opens Eo. Male and female in the sexual act represent Eo, the androgenism, the two Eos or divine polarities. The male represents the I, Jupiter, that penetrates and opens the O, the uterus of Ram Eo. Thus, both below represent Ram Eo, the earth, and above, the innermost, of both represents Jupiter. Let us now talk about Jahava. In the name Jahava, Jah represents the male female highest force of Yodhava, and Hava represents the lower male female force of Jodhava. See how the name Jahava is written. The letter het is written in the middle of the tetragrammaton, Jodhe Vavhe, the name of Elohim. The letter het represents life within the two polarities, male and female, above and below. In many lectures, we pronounce the name of Elohim as Jahava. Let us explain what Jahava is. Yod He Vav He is Yod Phallus, He Uterus, Vav Man, He Woman. Jahava has Het in the middle of Yod He Vav He. 
because het represents nefesh haya, the life soul of Jah, in that, acting through Hava, the mother of the living, in Yesad. Thus, when the two polarities of Yod He Vav He are together as a unity, that unity is represented by the letter Het that unites the two polarities above and below. Then they are no longer Yod Hava, the Tetragrammaton, but the Pentagrammaton, which is Yod He Het Vav He, Ja Hava. In English, yod he is translated as ja and Hava as Eve. In both names, we find the two polarities. We also find both polarities in the letter Het between them, whose shape is formed by the letter Vav and Zain. Thus, alchemically, the pentagram, yod he het bav he Yahava, is the name of Elohim, formed when we transmute his nefesh haya, the life soul of Binah. Yahava is alive within the alchemists that sublimate their nefesh haya, the life soul from their sexual waters in Yesod. The supreme leader of the positive ray of the moon is Jehovah. Havayot is exactly his antithesis, his rival brother. Jehovah directs the positive ray of the moon. Havayot directs the negative ray of the moon. Jehovah teaches white sexual magic. Havayot teaches black sexual magic. Samael on the from the perfect matrimony. When a Kabbalist knows this, but nevertheless ejaculates, through the orgasm, the Nefesh Haya, the life soul of Binah, represented in the letter Het, stored in the sexual energy, he then is no longer worshipping yod he vav he Jehovah, who grants life, spiritually speaking. Instead, he is worshipping Havaya, or Havayot, who is Jehovah's contrary, Jehovah's rival brother. Thus, through the orgasm, he is rendering call to Havayot, the negative Hava, the Yot, feminine aspect of the moon. Havayot, or Havayat, is also called Havayod or Havaya, an entity of evil, alchemically speaking. Havayot, Havayod or Havaya is the antithesis of Jahava because this demon ejaculates his Nefesh Haya, the life soul of Bina represented by the letter Het, stored in his sexual energy. Alchemically, Havaya or Havaya with Het means that Hava, Eve, the sexual organ, is ejaculating Ja, 
Who is contained within the Haya? This is precisely the black magic that Havayot, the demon, teaches in the internal planes. He teaches a doctrine contrary, contrary to Jehovah. Many Kabbalists do not dare to pronounce Jehovah, but they pronounce Havaya, the alchemical name of an entity who is a demon, <coughs> the demon Havayot. To pronounce Havaya and not Jahava is indeed absurd, yet this is what they do. They believe that when we pronounce Havaya, that is, yod he vav he backwards, we are not uttering the holy name of in vain. Thus we are doing, they say, the right thing. Yes, we must not pronounce yod he vav he the holy name of Elohim, in vain. But it is madness to pronounce the name of a demon instead of yod he vav he Havayot, the contrary of Jehovah, is very active in this day and age. Havaya, or Havaya, alchemically, signifies ejaculation of the life soul of God. When we transmute the Nefesh Haya, the life soul of Binah, we are then worshipping the forces of Jehovah who is represented alchemically as Jah and Hava, or Zeus and Io, in this beautiful mythological picture. Now we will comprehend the ninth precept in relation with the initiation of Tifereth. As you can see, Tifereth is in the middle of the tree of life, it represents the human soul, the soul that works hard in order to achieve self-realization. Tifereth is a human soul that incarnates Yeshua, the soul of Chokhmah, which means wisdom. Tifereth does this through the two polarities that we call Ava and Aima, the father and mother. Remember one of the commandments in the Bible that says you should honor father and mother. That father and mother relates to the father and mother of the human soul, not of the physicality that we have. Even though we had to respect our physical parents, the father and mother that we are pointing at here are precisely the two aspects of Bina, which relates to the Sephira Da'at, knowledge, that we had to develop while working in alchemy. When someone reaches the level of Tifereth, he becomes a true rabbi, or master, Kabbalistically speaking, who enters into Eloah va that the path of compassion. We already explained about Eloah va that in previous lectures. That is, how Tiferet exercises compassion to humanity on the direct path. This is why we find here Jupiter and Ram Io or are we say in Christian names, Joseph and Mary, being the receptacles of the soul of Chokhmah, which is Christ, in order for the Savior that we call Yeshua, Jesus, to enter into the spiritual womb, which is the spinal column of that master that reaches the level of Tifereth. Therefore, the ninth precept is related to Eloah va that. We must also understand that the ninth precept relates to Yesod, 
which is the ninth sephira in the tree of life, related to sexuality, our genitalia. The Sohar states, the night precept, Tiferet initiation, has rever ref reference to the poor and needy ministering to their necessities as it is written. And Elijah said, let us make Adam in our image after our likeness. Let us make Adam. Here the plural form of expression is used in Asia, meaning action in the physical world, in order to point out that through sexual alchemy, the creation of Adam was effected by Jah, the two divine principal essences of life in Haya, which is the soul of Bina, symbolized as Elohim. The male, El Hayam, which means the God of the sea, and the female, Ela Yam, the sea goddess. Zohar, Master Zamael on the Or in the Three Mountains states, Io, I Solda, the lunar, lunisolar androgen, Osiris Isis, has sparkled with terrible divini di divinity since the profound creation of all ages. The letter I, with its deep significance, is certainly the phallus, the lingam, the Hebrew yad. The letter O is the eternal feminine, the uterus, the yoni, the famous Hebrew he, Samael on the Zohar continues. In our image is the rich, corresponding to the male of Haya, the forces of Binah that are above the tree of life. After our likeness, the poor represents the female of Haya as well in Binah. In Ava and Aima Elohim, is where we find the image and likeness. This is what we have to understand. Image is male and likeness is female. Abba and Aima, father and mother, alchemically speaking. Now, just as Bab and Zain, the two divine joint essences of the letter Het, form with Jah, a single whole life, Haya. So Bavhe amongst humans out these two classes, the rich and the poor, symbols of Bav and Zain, the male and female, life principles of the letter Het, in the divine nature, of their spines to form life, Hava or Eve, by means of one whole sexual alchemical cooperation or common unity. Otz Haim, the spinal medulla, where we find the Shakti potential, Haya of yam, male and female living waters, haim in Malkut, which is also called Asia, Zohar. 
This is how the Zohar explains the ninth precept. Yet we unveil it more for your understanding. Above the tree of life in that <coughs> Ya joined to the letter Het spells Haya, which means life. Below the tree of life here in the physical world, when we work with alchemy, when we transmute our sexual energy between husband and wife in Yesod, then Vav He, man and woman, sexually united, form the letter Het. That which Vav He spells Hava, which is commonly translated as Eve. Who is the mother of all the living? We have to understand more about Hava, because usually Hava is associated with the female body. Yet remember that Hava also represents the male and female genitalia. Therefore, the head of Hava is formed when Vav and Zain, that represent the spine of man and woman, respectively, yonder jods or shakti potentials that are the outcome of the transmutation of their nefesh haya in the sexual act as vav hey man woman that is the alchemical meaning of hava if they as vav hey man woman eat the life the head or the fruit that is forbidden, they then transform Jahava into Havaja, who is the contrary of Jehovah. When we transmute head life, then we are worshiping Jehovah. This is precisely the mystery of the tree of life. You should not eat of the tree of good and evil, otherwise you lose head your life force, which is in the spinal column, the tree of life. Genesis chapter 3 verse 24 states, And he expelled out Nefesh Haya, the life soul of Binah, the Adam, and he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden the Kerubim, and the flame of a sword, which turned every way to keep the way of the tree of life, the spinal column. Let us continue with the Zohar. And let our image and likeness descend over the fish of the sea in Yesod, and over the fall of the air in Netzach and over the cattle in Hod, and every creeping thing that through sexual alchemy creeps up through the middle pillar, the spine above the earth, Malkut. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. The mystical meaning of which is the transmutation of lead into gold given and explained in the occult alchemical work by King Solomon. Thus, this is how we read Genesis alchemically. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26 contains statements that are addressing the alchemist. Let your image and likeness or let your compassion and veneration penetrate not only your physicality, but also your sword, hod, and netzach, and every creeping thing that creeps, or better said, every fiery thing that rises in your spine by means of sexual alchemy. This creeping thing is obviously related to the soul of the Mercury, that is Nefesh Haya, 
the live soul of Bina, which we are addressing here. When we read it alchemically, we then understand it. Since when men and women are sexually united and are transmuting their sexual energy, then that creeping thing, which is fire, creeps up through their spinal medulla, which is the tree of life. Alchemically, we will also say that this creeping thing is the fire of Kundalini, or fire of compassion, the serpent of brass that rises in the pole or spine of the alchemists, who venerate the fire of the Shekinah. who has compassion on the poor from his face and countenance will never fade away the reflection and glory of the divine likeness of the Shekinah, born by the first Adam, by which he ruled and dominated the whole animal creation, as it is written. And your compassion and your veneration shall be upon every beast of the earth, the fall of the air, every creeping thing that, and the fish in the sea. Into your yard hand are they delivered. All these revere and bow before the compassionate and venerated presence of Adam because of the divine image imprinted thereon, and is the only law of the Creator, enjoined upon the animal world that instills them with fear because of, his, of this image, first born by Adam, the Zohar. The image that instills animals with fear, first born by Adam, refers to Adam Harishon, in other words, to the first root rays that existed in the three-dimensional physical plane in the continent of Lemuria, <coughs> who were individuals who had Adam Kadmon crystallized within them. Or more exactly, they had the image and likeness of Elohim Binah within them. Any animal is always clairvoyant. When they see the image of Adam Kadmon imprinted within the true human being, they see it with veneration and respect. In this day and age, ignoramuses think that the present populace is made in the image and likeness of God. I would like to see those who believe they bear the image of Adam Kadmon to go into the zoo and jump in the lion's den and see if the lion will respect them and look at them with veneration and fear. I don't think so. We have to gain the respect from all animals. This is the problem with this humanity. They read Genesis and any sacred book literally, and they think that the human made in the image of God is already here. We always state that if that were the case, then God may be very ugly. The image of God is that only thing that is called, Kabbalistically, the Tzalem, within true humans. To bear that image, to incarnate that Tzalem, the Neshama Haim, in us, is not easy. Listen, as Hayot, beasts, or intellectual animals, we bear other levels of Haya. When we see a master, a human being, at the level of Neshama Haim, we respect and we venerate his Elohim. 
who made him into the image of yod he bab -He, as we see it there in the graphic of Solomon. According to that picture, God is bestowing him with his zalem, or image, in order for Solomon to exercise his wisdom. Such is the alchemical level of Solomon. The alchemical level of Saul and the level of David precede Solomon's level. We reach the higher alchemical level of Solomon when we have transmuted all of the lead of our personality into gold. At this level, all of the mirror or perfumes of the higher dimensions show through the alchemists. They become wise judges and great kings with compassion because they venerate only their God inside. This is why Master Jesus of Nazareth, who is another incarnation of that veneration and compassion, or the image and likeness of Elohim, wisely represented in his life, said when addressing the women of Jerusalem, Daughters of Jerusalem, weep not for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. For behold, the days are coming in which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear, and the paps which never gave suck. Then shall they begin to say to the mountains, Follow us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Luke chapter 23, verse 28 to the 31. Do you understand the sentence? For if they do these things in a green tree, what shall be done in the dry? Jesus is a green wood because he is always alive, since he is an alchemist. Yet, see how he is treated by the law. Despite him being an alchemist, that is, despite him always bearing the cross, by means of which he incarnated the image of God within himself, this does not mean that he can mock the law. In past lives, before reaching the initiation of Tiferes, we were doing devilish things. Now Jesus has to pay with us, and Jesus is paying by carrying his cross and by being compassionate to us. The daughters of Jerusalem. Who are the daughters of Jerusalem? To answer that, we need to know Kabbalah, because yod is father-mother, who are called Jah. yod up there in the At. The first letter He that appears in yod he bav -He, the holy name of God, is the mother in the At. But the second, the second letter He, which is the fourth, is the daughter in Malkut. This is how we see it in Kabbalah. So when Jesus said daughters of Jerusalem, he's not addressing women, but our physicality in Malkut. We are the daughters. We are alchemists. Yes, Jesus said, do not cry for me. I am just helping here, but cry for yourselves, because depending on how we behave with our physicality is how we will be judged in our children, meaning the children of God that we are building, because when the alchemists are in chastity, they become pregnant with Israel, with the Savior which is fire within their spinal column. The alchemists that beget 
within themselves children of light through transmutation no longer beget physical children. This is what Jesus said. For behold, the days are coming in the which they shall say, Blessed are the barren and the wombs that never bear physical children, and the paps which never gave suck. They are blessed because they are transmuting their sexual energy. Such is the physical meaning of barren, because we are multiplying ourselves inside and thus having a spiritual development. Alchemists do not have children in the physical world because they do not fornicate. I remember a female alchemist who talked to the Master Samael on the earth and said, Master, I am a woman and I need to have a child in this physical world. I have that longing. To have that longing is good, said the Master, because that is normal. But you are an alchemist. But if I do not have a child, let's say, that if the whole world become Gnostic, how are the souls going to incarnate on the earth? Master Samael answered, The day where you will see the whole world become Gnostic alchemists will be indeed a blessed day. But that day is not today. So do not worry. Billions of women are out there bringing children into the world. You are just one among millions that choose to be an alchemist. So why do you worry about bringing souls into the world? Other women who prefer to follow their animal instincts are doing it. So do not worry about children, daughters of Jerusalem. Remember the daughters of Jerusalem are the letter He. <coughs> it represents our physicality. It does not mean just females, but males too. When we are in veneration, we become female. We receive, we are receptive to the compassion of God on the altar of alchemy. Nevertheless, whether we are alchemists or not, we always have to pay the karma that we owe. For if they do these things in a green tree, an alchemist, why shall be done in the dry, a fornicator? As we see in this graphic, not all of the masters follow the path of compassion. There are certain masters that reach the level of Tifereth and they do not care about humanity. If they do it, they forget about other poor people who are poor in the way that they are not rich with knowledge. The Zohar states, as long as a human bodhisattva entertains and cherishes compassion and sympathy for the poor, he will continue to bear the image and likeness, while he, the alchemist, exercises compassion, he is truly human. When he ceases and refrains therefrom, he becomes and continues merely an animal, one among hayot. How can this be substantiated? From the life of Nabuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, or Malachim, whose dream of his own downfall was never realized whilst succoring the poor, the Buddha Datus. Immediately he ceased from deeds of charity and compassion and suffered himself to become filled with pride 
of heart and vain glory, vain glory. Then was heard the voice of the heavenly Father, or Watcher. The kingdom is departed from thee. That is, the seal and stamp of the divine Chokma, born by Adam, vanished from him, and he ceased to be human. His heart became changed, and a beast's heart was given him, and he was driven out from amongst humans, and dwelt with the beast of the field. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy neckness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with a eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will came Oh, I will come into him, and will soup with him, and he with me. Revelation chapter 3, verse 17 to 20. For this reason, the scripture, in order to express the creation of Adam, makes use of the words, Let us make Adam, to indicate that to preserve the divine image, we should be charitable and compassionate, as we see the rich and affluent Boaz was to Ruth. We read in the book of Ruth how this Boaz, a rich man, took Ruth into his home. She was poor. This is a symbol we have to understand because if you know about the Masonic passwords, when one enters the temple, one has to pronounce Jaquin and Boaz. Boaz is the left. When you get a lot of the spiritual riches, it is because you are working with the left, with the veneration. On the tree of life, you find the rich. On the right, and the poor on the left, which reaches Malkuth. When people in Malkuth are poor, spiritually speaking, it is because they are lacking veneration. When we, in the left, in Malkuth, venerate and meditate, and when we pray, it is in order to acquire the force of compassion from the right, and thereafter, we exercise our compassion to our fellow man. Because it is not you who is charitable, but your inner most. Understand this because the ego is the one that is selfish. It is the spirit who exercises compassion through the soul. This is why Hesed means charity, compassion. Thus, if you want your spirit to exercise compassion, you have to open the doors of your heart and soul and venerate him, your inner God, in order for your innermost to express and to give to the poor. Not necessarily to the poor economically speaking, in the sense of money. Sadly, this is how people always understand this. If I have money, then I am going to give to the poor, and that is good. Yes, it is good. But the main thing is to give wisdom, to give knowledge, 
to give the spiritual doctrine to those wretched, ignorant people who are paying a lot of karma and are suffering a lot because they ignore the law. If you are selfish and you don't teach them, they will continue making mistakes and always being wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked, not only physically, but also spiritually. Understand, a true Bodhisattva always gives. Nabuchanabazar, who was one Bodhisattva among many, <coughs> was one of them. But he ceased to exercise compassion for whatever reason and because he started boasting about himself and being proud and vain, he said, I am a master of fifth degree, follow me. Daniel, uh, in his book, states that Nabuchadnezzar, walking in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon, the king spoke and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power? and for the honor of my maj majesty? This is mystic pride and vanity. It's precisely what God does not want from us. He doesn't want us to have that within. Mythomaniacs deviate per ignorant people. Yes, they turn them aside so that they go and do nothing and perish because they start worshiping an idol. In the book of Daniel, we also read about the idol that Nebuchadnezzar built. That idol is built precisely when you make of that personality something that is not. You forget about your inner God and you start worshiping the personality of someone else. That is no good. We have to respect and honor the Elohim and to understand what the wretched physical personality is. Whosoever gives to the poor shall not want. Yet the one who hides his eyes for doing so will become a master with curses. Amarut Rabbi. When the wicked rise, his haya shall be concealed. But when Adam, pride and van vainglory in the heart perishes, the righteous, the Zadik, increase within. Proverbs. Chapter 28, verse 27, 28. This is an alchemical statement. <coughs> Very important to understand. Remember that the Sohar states that Meorot means lights and relates to the two lights that we work with in sexual alchemy. The two lights together, namely the light above and the light below, or the sun and the moon, are meorot. Remember, the letter Vav is the letter that symbolizes Tifereth and Yesod, the sun and the moon, Adam and Eve. Tifereth is where we find the humble soul in the heart. It is ruled by the sun the symbol of Judah and the symbol of Israel, who bestowed their strength through Geburah in Yesod, the moon. Now, when we take the letter Vav out of the middle of the word Meorot, it means that we take Vav from our heart and sex. In other words, when Adam and Eve 
ate the forbidden fruit, that is, when they experienced the orgasm, they, through the left pillar of the tree of life, took Meoroth, that is, they took the light of the sun and of the moon, out from their spine. Their Bav, the central pillar of the tree of life, became dark. They did it by means of the sexual cross, the letter Tav. They removed the Vav, symbol of the inner man, out from their spines toward the left into Klipot, through the orgasm. Thus, by doing so, they completely changed Meoroth into Maruth. Instead of lights, Meoroth, they got Maruth, curses. Marut in Hebrew means curses. In other words, Marut is a Hanas Mus. This is what happened to Nabuchadnezzar. Being a master of the fifth degree, Tifereth, he started feeling vain and proud in his heart. So then he turned into a beast. In other words, the image the sun and likeness, the moon of his inner being, being vanished, and the only thing that remained in him were curses. Marut, Ahaznamus, who was always boasting about himself and forgetting that God is the one that does things through him. This is why the book of Genesis states, And God said. That means God is the one who performs the work through ourselves. The alchemical work that we are performing in this physical world. Indeed, we are just people. Ordinary people. Like anyone. We do not have to be worshipped. Otherwise, people will turn us into idols, and that is bad. This is precisely what happens to those Kabbalists that like to be worshipped as Havayod or Havaya, which is also pronounced Havayot, a demon that relates to the physicality or evil beauty of Nahama or Nama, the negative aspect of the moon. The people of Nahemad or Na Nahama or Nahema are only concerned with vanity, physical beauty. This in order to attract fans, like any vain actor or actress of in Hollywood. Proud people are always concerned with their physicality, like Havaya, Havayod or Havayot, the contrary of Jehovah. That's why in the Conjuration of the Seven we say, In the name of Michael, may Jehovah command thee and drive thee, and drive thee hence. Havayot. The Yad of Jehovah, as the ruler of the positive ray of the moon, is hidden in Yesod, which is the Yad or Shakti potential of me, of the heavens above, or me, Hael, who is the splendor of the sun, Tifereth. In Israel, our El, God, in our psyche, shines when we transmute the sexual energy. Yes, in Tiferet is the Yad, or solar light, that the human soul retains when transmuting Yam, the creative waters established in Yesod, sex from the moon. 
fornicators spill out their yad, or shakti potential, the solar cristic light through the orgasm. They are not concerned with Michael, the solar spirit, but with their physicality. They say, how do I look? Do I look beautiful? They deviate, turn the solar force aside toward their lunar ego. Listen, if we are fornicating and studying Kabbalah, we are worshiping Havaya, Havayot. Fornicators do not worship Jehovah, the Elohim of the moon. Remember, the supreme leader of the positive masculine ray of the moon is Yod He Vav He, Jehovah. Yet, Havaya or Havayot is exactly his antithesis, his rival brother, or rival brother. Choose. In Exodus chapter 9, verse 3 and 4, we read, Behold, the Yad, or Shakti potential of Jehovah, in Yesod, and the Yad of Havaya, as in thy fornicator cattle, which are in the field, Yesod, as thy horses, thy donkeys, thy camels, thy herd, and thy flock, and every grievous pestilence, a very grievous pestilence. And Jehovah shall severe or severe between the yad or shakti potential of the reed of Israel, Tifereth, and the yad or shakti potential of the reed of Havaya. Mizrahim, Egypt, Malkut. And there shall no thing, no Yad or Yod, Shakti potential, die of all that is of the archetypes, children of Israel, Tifereth. Many Kabbalists in this day and age are following the read of Havaya, or Havayot and not the read of Jehovah or Jehovah. This is very important for all of us to know in order to find the differences, the differences in regard to the alchemical work, which relates to the moon in Yesod, the ninth precept. Now let us enter into the tenth precept. The tenth precept concerns the alchemical fixing and girding phylacteries for devotional prayer, the Zohar. Let us have more an in-depth study of veneration through tefillin, which means prayers. In Hebrew, the word tefillah means prayer. Tefillin is plural and means prayers. Yet it is translated as phylacteries, which is very common in Judaism. We are not going to study tefillin physically, but alchemically, in order to understand what the Zohar explains. Thy head upon thee is like God's vineyard. Carmel, son of Solomon, chapter 7, verse 5. Thy head upon thee is like God's vineyard. The word for vineyard is translated as Carmel. Someone told me that 
Karm L could be also associated with the Sanskrit word karma and L, which means God. So the God of karma, Carmel. Carmel relates to the Garden of Grapes. The name Carmen comes from it. You see, there is beautiful, uh, in this graphic, you see a beautiful priestess of Dionysius in Greece that has around his head the leaves of the grapes forming a crown. She is holding a staff with a pine cone that symbolizes the mind. <coughs> A tiger skin is covering her. She wears it on one of her shoulders. This tiger skin is a representation of willpower. This means that she is a priestess who in Greece, in ancient times, was working with the positive forces of sexuality of the god Dionysius. It relates to the devotee who is doing this devotional prayer, or tefila, or tefillin, to show that in order to be devotional, we have to work with the two polarities in our physicality. First, we have to understand that the two polarities, the sun and the moon, Adam and Eve, in our physicality are Pingala and Ida. Now, when we are married, we then work with sexual alchemy and join the two polarities of the man, Adam, with the two polarities of the woman, Eve, in the sexual act. There, in the sexual copulation, the couple, the couple control their left column of the tree of life, Ida which is related with evil. The left column goes down to Malkut and even Klippoth. Through the left column is how the soul falls into sin. All of this is alchemically speaking in order to understand the two names, Adam and Eve. Thy head upon thee refers to the prayer phylactery of the head, which represents the divine head, or in other words, the divine name of Jehovah, of which each of the letters stands for a verse of scripture, which plays within the four sections of spaces of the tefillah, prayer, phylactery of the head, correspond to the letters of the divine name. This is why we are taught by tradition that the word of scripture and all the people of the earth shall see that thou art called by the name Jehovah and they shall be in awe of thee refers only to this prayer of phylactery, the Zohar. That means that when we are doing this alchemical work, our head receives knowledge and people wonder, from where is this human, Tifereth, getting all of this doctrine and knowledge? Well, Tifereth, the human soul, is getting it from the divine head, namely Keter Chokma Bina and Da'at, which is the crown head, forehead and throat, which is from where all alchemists get Gnosis. When transmuting the Yad from Yesod, by being in chastity, by being righteous. The knowledge is there 
It doesn't belong to anyone. When we work seriously in ourselves with veneration, then compassion comes. In order to work with veneration, we have to know our anatomy, our spiritual psychosomatic anatomy. Esoterically speaking, remember that our physicality is Hava, Eve, alchemically speaking. Thus, as Hava, Eve, through our psychosomatic polarities, represented in the letter Het, we receive the knowledge of Ja. Adam Kadmon. Orthodox Kabbalists place upon the head a square with certain esoteric prayers, which are associated with alchemy. Indeed, it is not by writing prayers and putting them upon our head the way to receive knowledge and the doctrine from Elohim. Now, we have to exercise and practice what is written in those prayers. This is precisely the problem with intellectual Kabbalists. They know Kabbalah intellectually very well. Thus, they write what has to be written in those prayers in order to receive the knowledge from God. Sadly, in their common and ordinary life, they are fornicators. They ejaculate their nefesh haya, the light soul of Elohim. So how is their havaya, or psychosomatic nature, going to receive knowledge from Elohim if they eject haya, the soul of Bina, from within themselves? The science, science of alchemy is the teaching that they need to learn in order to know the right thing to do. The first space or compartment contains the verse that states, Sanctify me in every forge, all the firstborn, the Yad, which cleaves the womb, woman, slave, Malkut, among the children of Israel, heart, among Adam, brain, and among Behema, sex. It is mine. Exodus chapter 13, verse 2. The Zohar. The Yad is that which cleaves the Vav, or spiritual womb, of the woman slave, Agar, Malkut, our physicality, because we are slaves of this physical world. Among the children of Israel, among Adam and among Behema, the children of Israel are the alchemists, the children of God, who are the devotees of Jehovah at the level of Tifereth, who work with compassion, the heart in the forge of the Cyclops or the forge of Vulcan, meaning sanctifying the sexual alchemical work. In the sexual act is where we feel the forge, the fire. Among Adam is the Yad, the Shakti potential in our central nervous system, which is also the sexual fire of Behema in our seminal animal force. The common and ordinary translation states, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever opens the womb among the children of Israel, both man and beast. It is mine. We wrote the alchemical meaning in order for us to understand that Exodus chapter 13 verse 2 
is addressing the alchemist. In other words, Jehovah says, <coughs> in the sexual act, when as men you penetrate a woman, or when as woman you receive a man, give me that which is mine. Because the one who gives the nefesh haya, the life soul of Binah, is Jehovah, Elohim. Give me that fire, transmute it, sanctify it to me. This is the law of the cosmic common trogo auto egocrat, to receive and to give veneration and compassion. Through veneration we receive the compassionate living fire from Elohim in our head, heart, and sex, which in Yetzirah, the world formation, are Netzach, Hod, and Yesod. Thus, by sanctifying our three brains by means of the fire of Jehovah Elohim Binah, through sexual alchemy, we transmute and sublimate that fire back to Him. That fire is Yad, the firstborn, the Shakti potential of the sperm and ovum that he received from us. Give it to me, it is mine, he says. So veneration is not only related to the fire from our mind and heart, but also to the fire which belongs to Behema, the animal sexual force that belongs to the lower abdomen. We feel that passional behemotic sexual force in our sexual and our solar plexus. Give it to me, it is mine, says God. That is precisely the forge, the fire, the yad. Even if we are single, we, are, we have to give it to God through pranayama. Sadly, we use it only to fulfill a desire to satisfy passion in the animal way, in order to lose the sacred force, which is life, in our sexual energy. The Zohar continues stating, connoting the Shakti potential, the first letter of the Tetragrammaton, in other words, the letter Yad, Symbol of Keter, the first Shakti potential of the Ein Sof, of all divine origins. Again, the firstborn, according to Zohar, is represented by the letter Yad, which is that four that descends from Keter to Chochmah, Binah, to Tiferet, to Chod, to Yasad, and any in Malkut, in our physicality. Through sexual alchemy is how we return this Jad force up again. That is precisely what the Zohar states. Yad represents the Shakti potential. It is what we call Nefesh Haya, or soul life in Kabbalah, or in Hebrew. The first letter Yad opens as it is where the womb of the second, the hay, the larynx, by means of which the yad, the shakti potential, becomes fruitful with knowledge. Zohar. Remember, in the previous lectures, we said that Enoch describes the chorus of Nahera, which means brightness, light, the celestial river of light, as resembling the letter Yad, or creative Shakti potential. When the letter Yad, the firstborn, or solar Shakti potential, appears in the universe from the ends of or, or solar absolute, that Yad, as a bad, blooms or opens in order to become a current of solar light. Do you know how it opens? 
It opens like the shofar. That is a wind musical instrument of ancient times, made of the horn of a ram. One blows air through the small cavity of the shofar in order for the air to emit a sound or noise when passing through, the, through it and living through its large cavity. The shofar is precisely the yad that blossoms or opens, as it were the womb of the sound of the second letter, the he. Thus, by means of the wind, the shofar emits the sound of the word ja, or yod he, which is the first name of God that we find in the sephira chokma, that manifests through da'at. As we see, the Theomert Malogus first appears as light, as Keter, from the ends of Or, or Solar Absolute, and blossoms as Chokmah through Da'at, the throat. What I am is doing right now is blowing the Yad through my mind. Better said, Keter blows from above the Yad, the Shakti potential or solar light into my head, and the Yad opens as my crown chakra. It becomes fruitful as it appears as the hay in my throat, my larynx, and here I am uttering for you the knowledge that I am receiving from above. That is precisely the first mystery. The Zohar continues. <coughs> In the second space is enclosed the Tefillah prayer, and it shall be when Jehovah shall bring forth into the land from Exodus chapter 13, verse 5. Referring to the second letter, the He, whose womb, the throat, as just stated, is opened by Yad, the Shakti potential. In the Sefer Yatira, we read, by fifty gates or openings of the celestial and concealed temple, the Yad, the light power, enters and penetrates into He, that the word sound of Ja in that, through the shofar or trumpet, may be heard by the heart, the Vav, so hard. We already explained that the letter Vav is associated with hearing. When knowledge is being given, as for instance right now, the Yad is opening the throat of my larynx in order to give the doctrine. Yet, in order to receive it, we have to put our heart into activity. Since this knowledge is for Tifereth, our soul, the letter Vav is also associated with chastity. Because it is also represented by Yesod, sex. Vav is associated with our spinal column, which has the shape of Vav. The first verses of Genesis start with the letter Vav, because through it we listened, we hear, we comprehend the word of God. Thus we had to be alchemically prepared, open for that knowledge, or Gnosis. This is how we see the letter Vav when we are working in alchemy. That, or knowledge, 
in the shofar or shofar is security closed until Jod, the Shakti potential, comes and opens it and makes it sound, the word, heard by the heart, the vibe, typifying freedom from ignorance and the enfranchisement of the slaves and bond men. It was by the, it was by the sound of the word of that in the shofar that the children of the heart, Tifereth, Israel, march out of Egypt. So, would, so will it always be hereafter. The herald of freedom and deliverance, such is the esoteric alchemical explanation of the letter He in the throat that so hard. The blowing of the shofar, which is traditionally done in the Holy Land and in many places of the world, symbolizes the giving of the doctrine, the knowledge of Kabbalah and alchemy, that all souls must receive through their heart in order to become free from their ego's mental slavery. Yes. We are slaves of our own psychological defects, vices, and errors. Thus, the blowing of the shofar does not mean what people literally think, that it is a remembrance of the Israelites that were slaves in Egypt, and that Moses, the herald of freedom, came to free them from their slavery by means of the law that he taught to them at that time. For the Exodus is an alchemical symbol of actuality. People who study history are trying to find in all documents that prince of Egypt named Moses that took the Israelites into the Exodus because they are interpreting everything literally they ignore that alchemically, Moses represents willpower, which we have to develop inside, and that the knowledge that, that Moses delivered at that time is represented by the shofar, that alchemically also represents the spinal medulla, with which we have to work little by little by equilibrating our mind, heart, and sex in order to enter into the spiritual kingdom of God, the Holy Land, out of slavery. Right now, psychologically speaking, spiritually speaking, we are slaves of our egos. In this picture, of the resurrection of Jesus in relation with the blowing of the shofar, Jesus is called the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. When a spiritual resurrection happens within us, then our inner Yeshua our inner Savior, Jesus, opens the throat that and delivers the doctrine of resurrection, which is the true doctrine of the Exodus, which we should study. Resurrection is not what ignoramuses think, that in the future we will be resurrect, we will, yeah, we will resurrect physically speaking with the ego very fat as we have it. That type of Draculian resurrection is just for demons. We must first annihilate Dracula, our ego, in order to have the right for resurrection, spiritually speaking. 
Let us continue now with the third space or section. The third space or section is the secret of the unity of yod heh vav -He. It contains the tefillah or prayer, Shema. <coughs> Hear, O Israel, in the sexual and chemical copulation, yod heh our Elohim, is one Elohim. Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verse 4. It contains a commentary of the letter Vav, or serpent of brass, set upon a pole, the spinal medulla, which proceeds from Ja, the union of the two letters Yod and He. There are before it, before the Vav, better said, before two letters Vavs, or rather, Vav and Zain. Idaim Pingala, representing male and female nervous cords, and also male and female spines that form the shape of the letter Het. Het, Yod, and He spells Haya, which is a divine life in Yasod that descends from Jah in Daat, and that bachelors and bachelorates sublimate through Pranayama. And what husband and wife must rise through their spines when uniting their yolhe, lingam yoni, by means of the sexual or chemical copulation that unites their haya or shakti potential of them in Malkut, the second he of yodhe bavhe, so hard. In regards to prayers, Master Samael Omveor asked, while in agony during his process of resurrection, Why are people making so much noise in the streets? They answer him, It is because today is a religious day, and people are happily venerating the Virgin of Guadalupe, then he suddenly smiled and said, Poor people! They do not know how to venerate the Divine Mother, the Serpent of Brass. They ignore that only by means of the transmutation of the sexual energy, through pranayama or through sexual alchemy, can we truly venerate our Divine Mother. Indeed, this humanity is so asleep and they do not know anything about the Kabbalistic esoteric knowledge of the alchemists. Ima Elohim, better said, Aima Elohim, must be worshipped in the forge of Vulcan, the Holy Spirit. Let us now study the next prayer. The fourth space contains words of blessings and menaces to the congregation of alchemists, that is to say, to the congregation of Israel, by the observance of the rules of scientific chastity, by which they, the alchemists, should become the happiest and most powerful among the people of the world, of Malkut, the Zohar. Namely, and if you will indeed obey my commandments that I command you today to love Yod Chava, your Elohim, and to alchemically serve him with all of your heart and with all of your soul, he will give his Haya, the rain for your land, physicality. In its season, the early rain and the later rain that you may gather in, better said, transmuted, 
your grain and your wine and your oil. And he will give grass in your fields for your livestock. And you shall eat and be spiritually full. Take care lest your heart be deceived and you turn aside and serve other Elohim and worship them. Then the anger of Jehovah Chava will be kindled against you and he will shut up the heavens so that there will be no haya rain and the light will yield no spiritual fruit and you will perish quickly of the good land that Jehovah is giving you. Deuteronomy chapter 11 verse 13 to 17. Eretz, land, means for the alchemists their physicality. The rain that descends on our land is compassion from above. It is a rain of light, of love, and blessings that enter our physicality when we know how to venerate Elohim in the sexual act. Yet, when we ignorantly turn aside these alchemical commandments and think that these are not necessary, we then cannot receive compassion and light from above. When we turn aside and serve false Elohim through our lustful egos, then we worship them through fornication. The light rain of Elohim turn aside from us. For Jehovah Elohim has not rained compassion upon the earth, since there is not Adam to venerate the ground. But through alchemical chastity, there went up a mist from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Genesis chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Thus, alchemical chastity is the main command of Elohim, because it is through our Sabbath our physicality, our Hava, that we sanctify and purify ourselves. You shall therefore lay up these words of mine in your heart and in your soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your phallus, yad, hand, and they shall be as a frontlets between your eyes. You shall teach them to your children, talking of them when you are seated in your house and when you are walking by the way. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verse 18 to 19. I am seated in my own house right now in my own physicality and this is why i am teaching to your children to you children or archetypes of israel that to walk by the way is to walk on the path of chastity therefore since i am walking on the path i am teaching these words to you children To your archetypes. <coughs> and when you lie down and when you rise up, spiritually speaking, you shall write them on the door spots of your house and on your gates of your physicality, that your days and the days of your children, archetypes, may be, may be multiplied in the land that Jodhaba soared to your fathers to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth.
Is not this beautiful? This alchemical speaking, alchemically speaking, does not mean that you need to belong to a certain group in order to receive these blessings. It means that if you are performing those works in your land, that is, in your physicality, then heaven is open for you. This is called alchemical veneration. We have to venerate to worship only one God, who is Elohim inside of us. This is what Jesus said. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, Jehovah Elohim Binah, with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbors as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophet. Matthew chapter 22, verse 37 to 40. Do you see veneration and compassion in these first and second commandments? This is what Moses and Jesus taught. First, we love and venerate our God with all of our heart and all our soul, all our mind, and with all our strength, which is sexual strength. This is to venerate. That is the first commandment. The second is to be compassionate and love your neighbor as you love yourself. You inner God, meaning teach the same doctrine that you are practicing so that your neighbor can also develop spirituality. This is the meaning of these two commandments that we already talked about in previous lectures. This devotional prayer connotes the final hey or fourth letter of the divine name yod he vav -He, which is formed from and by including in it the other three preceding letters or prayers, Zohar. By studying these four tefillin or prayers related to the holy name of Elohim, the Tetragrammaton, we develop spiritually, based on our physicality. <coughs> this is what we have to understand. When we were in Israel, we were observing in the streets many religious Orthodox people who studied these phylacteries, or tefillin, but who interpret them literally. They were wearing these tefillin phylacteries strapped to their heads and to their left arm, which represents the left column. These phylacteries, or pair of small black leather boxes strapped to the forehead and to the left arm, symbolize the R skin, Malkut, the animality that we have to control which relates to the left side of the tree of life, our fleshy, instinctual, evil inclinations that we had within Malkut, which we had to transform. This is why these phylacteries had to be strongly tightened around our left arm. Of the two alchemical cords named in Sanskrit Idaim Pingala, the left phylactery the left, is the symbol of Ida. Intriguingly, Ida and Pingala are Sanskrit words. Nevertheless, when we write Ida in Hebrew, we write as Yod Dalet Ayin, 
which means to know how to have sexual intercourse, how to have sexual intercourse. Da, which means arm, or da, to evaporate. All of these words are a chemical, a chemically related to ida, the left side of the tree of life, and to the phylactery of the left arm. Now, uh, now uh, let us now read the Sohar's conclusion. From these observations, we may gather the occult meaning of the prayers or phylacteries. They are really explanations of the letters of the Tetragrammaton, or divine name yod heh vav -Heh, in relation with sexual alchemy. And therefore, the scripture states, Thy head upon thee is as Carmel, God's vineyard, and also, and the gate of thy head is like purple. We find uh, this image of the god Dionysius, the god of wine, which is the opposite of Bacchus who is worshipped by those people who, in their great bacchanalias, drink a lot of wine and get drunk. Yet, Dionysius is opposite. Is the opposite of Bacchus. Is a positive aspect of alchemy. Dionysius represents the wine of the holy transubstantiation, or sexual transmutation, that gives spiritual inebriation when we drink it. Alchemy was taught at this time in Greece. It is also related to that time when the Israelites went into the Promised Land and when they came back from it, they brought a lot of goods, a lot of grapes, because that is what is found in the Promised Land, our spinal column. A lot of fruits that we gather from Eden when we know how to transmute our sexual energy. That is why God's vineyard is related with Carmel. In other words, Carmel is a place like Eden, the garden of the Lord, where we find fruits and goods. And the gate of thy head is like purple. Indeed, since it is related to the same grapes that are usually purple. Now, Dalet means gate or door. Yet, in this verse, it is often translated as hair, which in Hebrew is Sahar. The word Sahar means also wilderness, which is what we have in our head when we are alchemically transmuting all of the forces or sexual energy, our hair turns into a wild wilderness. Then we understand the word of God because our head is becoming with our tefillin. So, Dalet comes from the root word Dal, signifying poverty, denoted by the prayer phylactery of the left arm since that of the head did not riches or wealth. And it is further added, the king is held in its plates or tresses, meaning that the divine name of Elohim is in the four compartments of the phylactery of the head. Whosoever wears the phylacteries, better said, Whosoever transmute their sexual energy, there the divine likeness for as Haya, the divine essence of Jah, is physically Hava, as male and female sexual life, expressed in yod heh vav -Heh. So the alchemist becomes hearer of his image. Furthermore, it is said, 
male and female created they them. Though the phylacteries also symbolize the male and female sexual life, Hava, Eve in Malkut, that when taken, better said, sublimated together between husband and wife, form in the sexual act, the unity, one unity or whole. Such is the symbol of the phylacteries of prayers. This is the whole explanation of these phylacteries of the tenth alchemical precept <coughs> that relates to veneration. How we have to venerate our inner God in order to develop that compassion within. Usually, people who perform religious veneration think that to venerate only one God is to believe in one deity outside of us and to not make an image means not to venerate any statue or any God outside of us. Such concepts are wrong religious interpretations because God is inside and not outside of us. This is why this physicality is given to us in order to know how to worship and venerate God within us. That is the first commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your head, mind, your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your strength, which is your sexual strength. When we do veneration, we then exercise compassion in different levels to our neighbor. From that force that we have accumulated when venerating our inner God, who is above in the superior dimensions, but within, not without. God gathering in you is given the doctrine. How are you going to physically gather the divine solar forces if you ignore the spiritual and psychological anatomy of your own nature? And if you ignore the key of David, he that opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. Jesus says in John chapter 4, verse 22, You worship what you do not know. We, alchemists, worship what we know. For salvation is of Yehu. Of the Jews. Revelation chapter 3, verse 8 and 9 states, I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. People do not know how to worship Elohim. They think that by only believing that there exists only one God, it is enough. Notwithstanding, there are millions and billions of people that believe in one God, namely Muslims, Jews, Zoroastrians, and Christians, but they do not receive anything spiritually. You have to be an alchemist, and in order to be an alchemist, you need to, to know the key of David in order to receive it spiritually. And we have to practice what we preach, or otherwise we become marutz, has namuzen. Now let us study the 11th precept <coughs> in order to understand this even better. 
the eleventh precept has refer uh, re reference to the Levites, better said, to the alchemists, and the giving of tithes or grains and the product of fruit trees, the Zohar. We find the laws that talk about sexuality in the book of Leviticus in the Bible, which is for those who transmute their sexual energy. This is why we find a lot of sexual statements in Leviticus, because this is for the alchemists who know about the priesthood of Yesod. People who read Leviticus literally and are fornicators, they do not know what they are reading. Leviticus is a book precisely for those who know about the mystery of alchemy. And Elohim said to the alchemists, Behold, I have given you the Haya, or soul of the mercury, of every herb bearing Zera, Zimen, or brute mercury, or seed, which is upon the face of the earth, and the Haya, or soul of the mercury, of every tree, which is in the fruit of a tree yielding zera, semen, or brewed mercury, or seed. To you it shall be for food. Genesis chapter 1, verse 29. The Zohar. Do you see the beauty of this statement? We previously explained that in order to venerate God, we had to know how to transmute our sexual energy. In order to accumulate that solar light in our sexual energy, we need to know how to eat, because the solar light is in the seed, in the grain. And that is why bread is always worshipped, because we make bread with the wheat and other cereals, also because in the grain is the solar life, haya of the Holy Spirit, or Jehovah Elohim. In this day and age, scientists are doing a lot of stupidities with our food. We find a lot of fruit that is adulterated. How do you recognize a fruit that has been adulterated? Easy. The seed is not there And if that fruit has a seed, when you plant it, it does not give another tree. Sadly, these days, we find seedless grapes. What a stupidity. In other words, seedless fruits have no Shakti potential, spiritual life, because the Haya of God is not there. When we eat such fruit, we are eating just the clipoth, the shells, masticating the physical, chemical elements in order to feed your body. But what about the Shakti potential that we need to transmute from our sexual energy? Alchemically, it is very clear that the Haya is in every herb bearing seed and also in the fruits of a tree yielding seed. Haya is all a light. This is what we have to understand. In this day and age, we are destroying the life, Haya, of God. We, as alchemists, when we go to the supermarket, <coughs> we have to struggle in order to find fruits whose seed has Haya the life of God. We know that if a fruit has seed, it has Haya of the solar logos, the compassionate force of the Ein Sof, or does go down to Malkut in order to feed with solar energy, with ore, with light, everything that has life upon the face of the earth. Thus, when we eat 
and adulterated fruit, we get the haya that we need to accumulate in our sexual energy. It means when we eat an unadulterated or that is not adulterated. And when we are performing the sexual act, we transmute it and give life and light to ourselves. These are the rules of alchemy. To eat non-adulterated fruit. Fruit that have seed in themselves. The Black Lodge, those demons and ignoramuses that are cross-grafting cross our fruit trees and destroying our fruits, now we find fruits that are bigger and a festivity to the sight and with a peachy palate. But they are garbage. If you are an alchemist, such fruits are lifeless matter. If, if, if the fruit that you are eating is natural, good for you. If you are going to make bread with natural wheat, good for you. Eat it. That way you will have the Christic light in you and thus be able to grow and multiply. Solar light is in relation with good faith. As alchemists we become good thieves. Remember that there, are, that there is a good thief and an evil thief on each side of the crucified one. When we are transmuting our sexual energy, we are stealing light and fire from our lust devil, from our sexual force. This is why Jesus on the cross is looking to the right and the right thief is asking him, Remember me when you come into thy kingdom. Thy kingdom is here. This thief is an alchemist. He is very wise. He is transmuting his sexual energy and following Jahavah. So he has a lot of force. He is stealing the solar energy from his own body. Jesus said unto him, Today I promise you will be with me in paradise. Because you have the fuel for that. The thief to the left is an evil thief. Why? Because even though he knows alchemy and Kabbalah, he is fornicating. He is going down because he is dry wood. He is not green wood, but dry wood. And therefore he goes down. You can know a lot about Kabbalah and a lot of esotericism. But if you are a fornicator, you go down. The evil thief is just a fig tree without fruit. And behold, I have given the children of Le Levi all the tents in Israel for an inheritance, for their service, which they serve, even the service of the tabernacle of the congregation. Numbers, chapter 18, 21. And also, in Leviticus 27, verse 30. And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, is Job Chaba. It is holy unto Job Chaba. We have to give the, the tithes. The law is the law. If we are alive here, it is because we are eating the life from God. If you are a priest or an alchemist, that is helping humanity. Then the tenth is for you, for your service. Ten percent from what is God's. In other words, your physicality received the Yad, or Shakti potential, but that Shakti potential belongs to God. If you are a priest, if you are a Levite, you are given a light, therefore you are 
you are giving light, therefore you have to receive light from God. Do you see that? If you give light, you receive light, otherwise you do not. This is the tide, or the tithe. Let us explain in depth about it. So let us delve more into this 11th precept of alchemy, related to the tithe, in order to understand it. And the king of Sodom went out to meet Abraham. And Melchizedek, king of Zalem, brought forth bread and wine. The wine reminds us of the grapes and the bread, the seed of wheat, real wheat, in order to bring that to Melchizedek. And he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heavens and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thy enemies into thy yard, hand. And Abraham gave him tithes of all of the Shakti potential which he gathered inside. This is in Genesis chapter 14, verse 17 to 20. Matthew Samael states, In its esoteric or public aspect, within the Jewish legislation, the tithe is the universal obligation that all the brethren of the path have, which is to loyally contribute part of their income that should not be inferior to the tithe in a free and eligible way in accordance to what the brethren judge to be more opportune and effective in order to support the cause of truth and justice, the three mountains. In order to pay the rent, in order to pay the electricity, in order to pay anything in this world, we need money. That is why we need the economic cooperation of everybody in order to keep ahead with this work. In other times, when the governments of the earth were not asking for the tithes, or were not collecting taxes, a lot of people were bringing seeds and animals to the priests, the Levites. Thus, they were feeding themselves from these grains or animals in order to support themselves physically and to keep preaching. In this day and age, I don't think that if people bring grains and hens, here we can resolve the problem of the rent, etc. Even though if you bring corn or whatever we need, it is welcome. Your cooperation is appreciated in order to support this school. And every school, any religion, any organization needs the help of his attendance in order to subsist in this physical world. Matthew Samael also said, the tithe in its esoteric or secret aspect symbolizes the scale of payments in the sphere of Neptune. It is unquestionable that here we have to arrange affairs with the enemies of the King Lycos, the Lords of Karma. It is undoubtable that we assass assassinated the god Mercury, Hiram. It is not possible to resuscitate him within ourselves without previously having paid for this object, object crime. Therefore, the tithe becomes a practical and necessary complement of the dynamic principle which emanates from the profound study of the Ten Commandments. In other words, 
we must consider the mysterious Yad, which is hidden in the middle of the central delta of the sanctuary of our being, as a fountain, spring, and a spiritual providence of all the interior and divine centers of our life. This point of the tithe is clarified with the words of the gospel. But lay up for yourself treasures in heaven, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Matthew chapter 6, verse 20 and 21. Malachi, in chapter 3, verse 10, says, Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house. <coughs> Improve me now herewith, said the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour in you out a blessing, that there shall be not room enough to receive it. All of these were the three mountains by Matthew Samael on the earth. The sphere of Neptune the Empyrean is at the top of the tree of life. Kabbalistically, that is the highest aspect of Keter in the world of Yetzirah, the world of formation. This means that when we elevate ourselves initiatically from Malkut to Keter in the world of Yetzirah, the world formation, there we have to pay the tithe to the god Neptune. Why the god Neptune? What does Neptune have to do with it? Neptune is Poseidon. Poseidon is the god of the water. We have spoken a lot about Elohim as El Hayam, the god of the water, and El Ayam, the goddess of the water. They are the male-female aspects of Jehovah Elohim Binah. They rule the sphere of Neptune, the Sephira Keter, in the world of Yetzirah and Asia. And Elayam said, let us make, which is the word Asia, not good, Adam in our image, after our likeness. And in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, this is written. And Jehovah El Hayam form Adam of the dust of Adama, Asia. We already explained that Keter rules Atziluth and Chochmah rules Bria, and that Jesira is ruled by Jehovah Elohim Bina, the Holy Spirit, whose atom is in the pineal gland, ruled astrologically by Neptune, that controls the sexual waters of Aima Elohim. We place Neptune in Keter in the world of Yetzirah. This is how we have to understand it. The four worlds of Kabbalah are Atiluth, Bria, Yetzirah, and Asia. Yetzirah is a world of formation, and Asia is a world of action and matter. We have to control the fluids of our sexual glands by means of sexual alchemy through the forces of Neptune in the pineal gland. These are the forces of the Holy Spirit. When we do it, we raise the energy of our genitalia towards the pineal gland. And this is how we acquire knowledge and how we multiply inside. This is how we finish with the ninth, 10th, and 11th precepts in accordance with the Zohar. Do you have questions?
So you opened up with a story about Daniel. Um, I was having a little difficulty understanding the, the archetype represented by King Darius in that story. Because King Darius, he seemed compassionate to Daniel, right? Mm -hmm. And he, uh, he, he rejoiced when, when, when Daniel successfully made it out of the lion's den. But he also passed this law saying, worship, uh, uh, worship only me. And then he criticized Daniel for, for not following that law when, he, when, he, when uh, Daniel worshipped his God instead of King Darius. So, what's going on with King Darius? <laughs> <laughs> the king, you see, a malachim. In other words, he's a master of the fifth degree. So he's like Nebuchadnezzar. Like Nebuchadnezzar, exactly. exactly. Because Darius was the son of Nebuchadnezzar. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. But anyhow, this is a symbol of about the initiation. Darius, of course, was in his kingdom, like in any kingdom, and being uh, organizing the the or Persian kingdom at that time, right, of Daniel. But there were a lot of people that were envious of Daniel, and they were the one that came to Darius and says, "Hey, we." We should give you respect because you are the king. What do you think if we make a law for 30 days, only 30 days, that whoever doesn't worship you, we will throw to the lion dance? And then Darius said, oh, yeah, it's a good idea. I need respect. But they did it in order to hurt Daniel. So Daniel, when he hear that, he continued doing the worshiping because when he initiated this in the path, you have to worship only one god. Oh, but the king, okay, well, the king says, I don't care, it's, it's my God, you know? And also represents the intellect also, because the intellect is the king of this world. And that's why Daniel, I mean, uh, Darius recognizes that Daniel is a great prophet, has a lot of knowledge, and he's from God. But here, these, uh, his enemies uh, made him to write that law in order to hurt him. And now he has no choice. You sign it, Cain, so, well, throw Daniel into the den of lions, right? And then that's why he was worried about it. Because he recognized it was a master. And because he controlled, and this is precisely an initiation, when you reach the level of the sphere of Neptune, you pass through that initiation. And when you are thrown in the internal, internal planes into the den of lions, if you don't pass that, it's because you don't have the compassion that you need to develop. I remember Matthew Samael on the or in his time. He said to me, not to me, but to other missionaries at that time. I'm talking to you about how to meditate here and how to comprehend that meditation is the way. And I do that. But let me tell you one thing. I am in the level, at the level of Neptune right now. And I had to pay my tithes. But before that, I had to pass a certain ordeal, which is to be in the den of lions. They put me the ordeal already three times, and I didn't pass it. I don't know, he says, but you must say, no, oh, this, this is easy. No, no, I, say, I would like you to see if a lion enters right now into this room. One lion, he says. If you are going to not to be afraid because this is a wild beast. But not one, but a den. I mean, a, a pride of lions. It's not one, many. And I didn't pass it. And I'm meditating. And I'm trying to <laughs> inquire why I am not passing the ordeal when I have no ego already. Something that I am missing. And I don't know yet. But finally, he passed it. Because he discovered that he should show compassion to the lords of karma. Because when you are at that level, they come to you and they say, you owe this. And then you hear, oh, again, please forgive me. No, you have to pay it. This is the law. And then you have to, to face the lions of the law. And every time that he was there, he was not feeling so pleaceful with <laughs> the lions because he didn't develop that love towards karma. This is precisely what we have to develop. If they are collecting me this debt, 
is because I did something wrong. So therefore, I don't have to show animosity to the one that is collecting it. It's not his fault. He's just accomplished with the law. He's a judge of the law, a police of the law, and you have to face. But when in the internal plane you see a lion enter into your room, I have many experiences with that. I, I'm really afraid because I know if I am awakened, I know that there's karma that is against me. And to say to the lion, okay, thank you for coming. I owe something, no problem. But to feel that in the entirety of your being is not easy. And that's precisely being done when you are really venerating your own God and you understand and completely awake your consciousness in that way. Even if you don't have ego, you have to develop your soul too. Then you pass your deal. And that's precisely the, the, in relation with the laws of karma. You have to love your neighbor as thyself, right? Well, the collectors of karma are also your neighbor. But right now with the ego alive, I don't think that you will love your neighbors, <laughs> right? You have another question. Yeah, it's related to the, the 50, yeah, it's in relation with the Pentalpha or the five aspects of the Divine Mother. Because remember that the letter He represents the feminine aspect of God. And God, as feminine, has five aspects that we study, which are the five aspects of the Divine Mother, which is the Mother Space, Mother Nature, Mother Death, your, your mother inside you, psychologically, spiritually, and the fairy mother that relates with magic. Those are the five aspects of the Divine Mother, the He, or above, right, of the Shofar. Because if you see the, the, that horn that usually they use in order to blow, has the shape of the letter Yad. But it is it's closed. When, when you blow it, you open it, and then it is the word, the knowledge that comes. That's in, in relation with, of course, with the 50 gates. It means that uh, you have to open the 50 gates of knowledge and wisdom in yourself in order to reach that level. In the world of Yetzirah, world of formation. Another question? Is that to, to, to hide your eyes or turn your eyes away? That's, uh, you become a cursed rabbi. Is that to, to, to hide your eyes from, from God? Is that what that was referring to in that, that quote there? Uh, a cursed rabbi, or, or, or I mean, translating that as, as a master, right? Because ra rabbi means master. When you are serving and you can, can give the doctrine, but you don't give it, you are turning your eyes from the poor. Oh. So therefore, because you are turning your eyes from the poor, God doesn't give you knowledge, doesn't give you your doctrine. Even if you were the phylacterist, right, in yourself, because this is precisely what faithfully all of these Kabbalists do in order to receive the doctrine. They put all of them in themselves, but they don't give. Hmm? They think that to give is just go to the neighbor and, and give, uh, physically speaking, uh, some chickens, or money to support uh, this and that, which is, is also given. But what uh, Sohar explained there is the doctrine, light, wisdom. This is how you receive. If you don't give this doctrine, for the, this knowledge that I meditated many days, and all of that that Sohar was uh, written about, and I receive it, and I receive more, but I give what I think you daughters of Jerusalem are capable of understanding. And I hope you are understanding in this lecture what I'm trying to, to say, you know what I mean? Because 
Compassion and devotion is something that goes with the two columns of the tree of life. When you control the middle column, which is the central column, which is your spinal column. Hmm? Remember that. You want to receive, you have to give. Because God gives that does the law of sacrifice. You want me to enlighten you, to give you light? Give to the poor. Meaning, to the ignorant that do not that they don't have riches in heaven. Because in this day and age, uh, we have uh, only riches in this physical world. You find a lot of millionaires, people that are worried about making dollars and more dollars in order to be millionaires. But don't worry, nobody worries about the, to be rich in heaven, to receive the doctrine, to see heaven, to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Nobody worries about that. Because they are just concerned with the physicality. Not uh, understanding that when we die, we don't take anything from this physical world. Only the doctrine, the knowledge, the wisdom that we develop inside, in the soul. That we take. For in this physical world, we don't take anything. There's a lot of people that say, the master says, uh, we have to resolve one e equation. The half of the equation is to survive in this physical world. The other half is to develop wealth in the kingdom of heaven. People usually resolve the first part of the equation. And they get money, they got a house, they got this, that. But they get identified with that first part of the equation, and they forget about the second part. So when they die, they leave everything here, and they take to the other world, and they are examined. What did you build internally? Ah, but in the physical world, I had this building. I had this. Uh, we don't care about that. We care about your spirituality. You have zero. <laughs> Go back. And they come back again to make more money. That's the problem. <laughs> uh, thank you very much. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org.